Path of Night is an actual play Vampire the Masquerade podcast set in the world of darkness. We're all friends, we're here to have fun, but our story can include graphic violence, drug use, sexual content, and other mature themes. Content warnings can be found in the show notes. We talk at our table about safety, comfort, and consent, both as players and storytellers. We know what to expect, we're all excited to be here, and we want you to feel the same. So listener discretion is advised. Now... Let's walk the path of night. Last time on Path of Night, the Tamahira arrived and activated Britta as the agent Canary. She escaped from Pendragon to join them on their mission to kill Vito Zentosa. Though Britta took control of her own mind to back from her new captors, they remained otherwise in control and prepared for the raid. Miles and Ira woke wind from the effects of Shimmerstree. Johnny clashed against a werewolf. Though the hunter crystal was lost, Johnny managed to save the injured Suarez along with the other hunters. With Sheila's help and a bit of blood, the Bra remained in control enough to head back to the quarry. Reddo, usually, ever since you've become kindred, the rest you experience during the day offers little comfort. Nothing like a good night's sleep used to do as a human. But this time it was worse than usual. You arise this evening feeling depleted after this series of trials that you have undergone. When you rise, you are surprised to see that you are not the first to do so. Naturally, Romeo is haunting this place, giving everyone their privacy, but he doesn't really feel the weight of the day like the rest of you. But Perun, Perun doesn't seem to have needed to sleep at all, and he has spent his time organizing maps, making final preparations, finishing up the work Eagle did to prepare everyone's gear for the mission at hand. And as each of you file into the meeting space of your haven, he is ready to go. It's been a long time since Britta has slept in her own sleeping bag, but recontextualizing it with its intended purpose, sleeping behind the bar and watching people kind of come out from where they would go and there's a sense of practice in it. They've done this before and they remember it, right? Yep. So that is, it makes it feel even less like hers. But Britta rises and goes over to start investigating the maps and see if she can memorize some of these details. See what they refer to? As you get close, they're marked up maps detailing information regarding Sterling Memorial Library. It is a library that is on Yale campus, and that seems to be where the group of you are headed. Are there other things there beyond maps? You do see some notes. Uh, It looks like it's notes largely from the Nosferatu, detailing some of the activities of the Tremere there. And not that these notes were prepared for the benefit of the Tomahera, more like this is intercepted information, and they have pieced together some of the identities of the what are called acolytes and apprentices that reside there. You're quickly getting the impression that you're about to perform a hit on New Haven's Tremere Chantry. And then you see the profile on the Zentosa family. Breda picks it up and starts reading. As you look through it, there seems to be some sort of discussion on it about events that took place during the Anarch Revolt. That a group who would later become known as the Black Hand, not the same Black Hand, was involved in orchestrating a strike to support the Zemitsi in betraying their clan founder. The notes specify that this Black Hand... I'm, I'm imagining Britta's confusion, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to think how she takes in that separation you find yourself thinking a bit about johnny sire like ah yes okay and 
in it, there is an assassination that is performed on the Zemisi antediluvian. But in these notes, you find that there is a great deal of uncertainty. A name, Lambach, is mentioned more than once. And in these notes, you come to find out that the Zantosa family was extremely loyal to the, the clan founder and had gone by the name Zantovich. In these notes, there is mention of them changing names and fleeing to the New World, smuggling some object of grave importance. And that object is taken to Connecticut and then New York. You get the impression that a certain Zantosa is a remaining member of the group that smuggled this thing. Is there any indication of this object's dimensions or qualities? There is not. Okay. As uh, you read through, Perun actually sits next to you. Britta looks over, a bit of curiosity automatic at the fact that he didn't seem to have to sleep. She's not familiar with how that could even be true for Kindred, but she doesn't really clarify that she's very focused on these notes, trying to figure out, sort of flipping between options. As she would intake information about the Zantosa family and their history with Zmitsi, she would like then look over to the Tremere Chantry and trying to do the mental math in her head. That's probably when she looks up and catches him. It was believed that with the destruction of the ancient, that through the well-placed strike, we would be free of the disease, but it found a way to live on. There are those who think that this is some sort of uh, gift, that it is something that can be leveraged for power, but they are wrong. It is damnation manifest. When you say damnation, what do you mean by that? The Sobat believes that vicissitude is a discipline, a simple power spread among packs, among the diocese of the Sabbat, a power like any other, but they are wrong. It seems sometimes to behave like an infection. It is an infection. It is an entity, an invasion. And as the Sabbat spreads, so too does it. And there will come a night where it is all, and all are it. Unless we find a way to kill it, to purge its existence. But killing the Xantosa, would we even be able to find that remnant? We know where it is. You've come so terribly close. I can see that in you. You went to the house, did you not? We did. And even though you wisely did not venture to what lies beneath it, you know it is there. And you know that it is not content to remain there. There was a feeling in that place. I mean, like that, but do you have a way to kill it? I do not know that life and death mean to it what it does to us. But I know that it is dependent. The most powerful aspects of it are the limitations by which it can be beaten. It is an infection of the flesh. Deny it the flesh, and you deny it of its ambition, of its path to victory. Making sure it has no caretaker and that it won't be fed further. We can isolate it. The caretaker knows what it requires. That it requires anything means that it is not without limit. And even if it isn't, even if we can't place it within the usual bounds of life and death, then maybe finding a way to freeze it like a virus in ice. You are familiar with Romeo. Yeah. You are familiar with the realm that Romeo occupies. The Britta. place of emotion, dreams, and death, but a place without flesh. Britta goes a bit cage here at the mention of the Shadowlands, because the mention of the Shadowlands reminds her, even as she's 
starting to go into planning mode and very much understanding that the Sabbat are drawing nearer and nearer and that she doesn't want them to have uh, access to this power. But the mention of the Shadowlands brings back the bits and pieces that she can remember walking in and how gray it was and the training. So, caginess. The second the muscles in your body tense, the second there is even the most subtle display of potential action, Eagle, the ebony-skinned Asimite, who, as a member of this column, can be seen right beside Perun, resting a hand on his shoulder, indicating that the two are, are very close, and he simply watches you. An unspoken warning that your unaffirmed loyalty is noticed, and that he is very protective of Perun. Britta doesn't hide the mixture of feelings with that, because... One of the few things she can remember about Eagle is him protecting her during training. At least from greater harms, she doesn't really can't pin down details or that kind of thing. But that was one of the sensations that she felt looking around the room and hearing everyone's name. So she looks up at Eagle, not really hiding the experience of conflict that she's having. But she's not moving either to cause harm. She's just in her feelings about it. So you really think... That would fix it, bringing it to the Shadowlands. I do not know for sure. But I know that if nothing is tried, if we do nothing... It'll just get worse. There's a quiet moment, and Shrike enters the group, gives a wave. Evening, folks. I think we're ready to go, right? Eagle gives a nod. You have the Chantry. This is the location you think for it? Shrike speaks up. We're heading under the Chantry. They are very well defended, and I imagine I couldn't get Vito out of the Chantry, but summoning him worked before. Britta is back to trying to pull emotion back in. Something about Shrike is making her... She emotionally does not know what to do with him. It doesn't make sense to her that, like, he's so flippant uh, in some ways, in most ways, as far as she's seen so far. Virtually every... And, like, is an itchiness of that reminding her of Miles, making her, like, frustrated and how much she misses her coterie. <laughs> but as well, it's it's just so anti-resonant. The flippancy between, like, her not being able to place what their rapport or anything or... She does not know their connection, and so this reaction makes her want to close back up. Where she was willing to show Eagle, like, her internal state, that willingness does not seem to extend to Shrey. But in this moment, she is hoping to angle the Tremere away from harm. That's what she's looking towards. Shrek smiles, and it is a very disarming smile that almost confirms your concern about the sort of threat the man is. And he says to you, the Tremere make the same mistake that many, many, many others do. And that is they fill their homes with so many security measures that they start getting in the way of each other. And the truth is, the place is sealed like a vault. It's got every trick that they can manage. And that's great. That works for us. It helps. You see, the Tremere are, I don't know if lazy is the right word, But they're so engrossed with their studies that they prefer to have others do the remedial tasks that their homes require done. And that means that they have acolytes, mortals, ghouls who run their errands, perform some security details, all these little odds and ends that keep the business running. So, the trick about getting into a Chantry is learning about all the little places that the people in the Chantry need to get to to get their occult paraphernalia, their ritual components, their blood. Things got complicated, and we never really got the opportunity to insert you guys the way we would have preferred, but I know some of their acolytes. And so long as the acolytes in the Chantry, we don't need to worry about getting through Tremere Blue Ribbon Magic Tricks or whether or not our target can't escape the room, or whatever he's trapped in. All we need 
is one of their acolytes that we know inside on the other side of their defenses. And that's where the summon trick comes in. Britta glances at Romeo, if he's visible, at the mention of, well, it wasn't how he wanted. She can't tell if Romeo might know what he means by that. Not that a glance would give her much information, but... Romeo gives a look like he understands what he's referring to. So, we get into position. I summon the acolyte. The acolyte opens the door. No. I don't know how much we're going to need the acolyte once he's opened the door. But up until that point, he's quite useful. There's no need to kill him. He gives you a look. Britta knows when she says it that there's arguments. And she's not saying it with confidence. All right, Agent. Lay it on me. What advantage do we get by the acolyte wandering off to get help? Or maybe we can take the acolyte in with us as a hostage and render one of our own teammates uh, useless while we try to get the job done. Britta doesn't actually have an argument. She she knew when she said it that it was... Yeah. She's hoping to come up with an answer, but she doesn't have one. Um, so she looks down, but her jaw's tight. So here is my suggestion, right? Drink him dry. He goes out. Probably the happiest he's ever been. And he doesn't have to be a Tremere someday. A double win. Britta makes a couple calculations internally, but gives a tight nod. All the highlights of the guy's life are behind him. Be the last good thing. The nod is not for Shrike's sense of humor. <laughs> well, he seems convinced. <laughs> And he just kind of, you know, enjoys the uh, company of the column as he puts on body armor. He has this, like, navy blue kind of top coat. And he suits up into something sharp. Britta, seeing that it's go time, she replaces the finishing details, getting the knife strapped on, making sure that what can be concealed is concealed. Shrike turns and offers you a trench coat. Britta! It's okay. We vampires do this thing wearing these all the time. Oh, my old similarity is really freaking Britta out. <laughs> Mine's better. <laughs> Somewhere across New Haven, Miles is incensed. I think there's like this odd pause, <laughs> but Britta does, with a bit of a stiff nod, take the trench coat. The group of you head to the armored truck, and you go. The armor truck is loud. It's not a comfortable, you know, trip. It's not exactly like the sports cars that you've become used to. Mm. Um, But it gets you there. And when you get there, the group piles out and starts heading to the library. And as you walk, you begin to notice that the people who walk the sidewalks, who hang around the entrances to the various buildings on campus, ignore you. It's like the group of you aren't there and your outlandish, ridiculous outfits don't catch their eye at all. You are in a massive crowd, a huge throng of people, and are totally alone. Britta sticks closer to Romeo. If she can't, if he seems there and gone in the way that wraiths sometimes are, she'll, I guess, move a bit closer to Perun. But it, weirdly, in this moment of transition she's getting very caught up in the fact that she can observe people like this it seems so human to just walk around these people who can't even see her and uh makes the contrasts worse but she's keeping a wide eye out as you get to the door the library is actually closed up due to the time it is and romeo gives a uh subtle nod to the group those who can see him and this phantasm of a once Tory door seems to interact with the building, and the door comes unlocked and opens itself for you. At the click of the door, Britta readies the pistol. She's not raising it, she's just keeping it in her hand. Shrike and Eagle actually follow your lead on that, readying their weapons. And the group of you head in. Tanaka speaks up. This was the most fortuitous moment, but up here is going to grow dangerous. And she rests a hand on the door and seals it in time so that it may not be interacted with. What does that look like? A pulse. Britta watches the curiosity again, flickering. She can't help but to wonder about it. Shrike leans in. 
You want to hear a weird story? Was the group of you are heading downstairs? Britta, like a little absorbed by the strangeness of this pulse and that like maybe sense of time emanating from it, is not expecting Shrike to get like up close and personal. So she, she's a bit of, it's not really like a jolt, like it's not that that far, but it is like the, the, the surprise just like comes startle. through. A startle, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she looks back at him again, just so confused by how to relate to him, but after a an expression that probably reads as what is this does kind of nod she reaffirms the nod after she realizes that she's given the world's vaguest answer check this out perun wasn't going to allow the mission to happen without you you see eagle has these divination rituals where he basically smokes a bunch of caliph and finds out what's going to happen right you know caliph is yeah. you know caliph is you know yeah, okay. So he uses that, and he knows two things about what's about to go down. One is that the entire city is not going to give a crap about what happens to this building for the next night because there is a no-shit lupine attack that is right about to go down. Britta looks extremely concerned at the idea of a lupine. She knows how bad that goes, and her brain's going to the killing spree as they have a history of doing that. Oh, yeah. Lupine here in a city. It's going to be insane. Uh, empathy? What? Is he doing that? He seems very excited about this werewolf being placed. He seems like he might have had a hand in that. Roll empathy. <laughs> empathy what? A perception. Difficulty? He's pretty good. Eight. Uh, what do tens do again? They count as two because you have a spec. So that would be a three, even if he's pretty good. He's pretty good, but you know his type at this point. He is not responsible for it. Mm. However, just as you are drawn to beautiful art, as you are drawn to stunningly crafted jewelry, he is drawn to carnage and pain and suffering. And he has an idea of just how bad it can be when a lupine shows up. And he's just kind of looking forward to seeing the aftermath. He doesn't care at all who gets hurt. He's just happy someone is. Britta tracks that and tries to conceal her own reaction. Oh, yeah, the other one. Apparently, we don't stand a chance unless you're on the team. So I was wondering if maybe you had a story for me. Because you're good, but you're not that good. No offense. It's not like I remember to crack to you. So, story... What is his body language as... His body language is somewhere between that of a cat burglar and a soldier sweeping an area for hostels. Britta's not sure, even if she wants to give a story back, but she can recognize that this is useful information that he seems to be dangling in front of her. So she's willing to play the game. And the first story that comes to mind is... When we ended up going to Hell House, it was, even from the outside, you could feel it. There were pretty details, some stained glass mural, but even before the door opened and you could see the way that the bodies were set up and altered and the things moving around in that place, it felt so oppressive that... When we finally got hold of the Xantosa, and we were ready to leave with him, I don't... That was the first time that I really started to get a picture that this was even a part of me. I'm the reason that Vito's kindred. Hmm. Well, this time, cut his fucking head off. All right? He steps on... And it isn't long before Perun telepathically addresses the group at once and says, We're here. As you advance downstairs to one of the cellars of this massive library, you come to what looks like a zone that is sealed off with two steel doors. There's do not enter sign right on it. And when you see the sign, I need you to make a willpower check. Two successes. With two successes, you resist the very subtle urge to not go anywhere near the door and ignore it completely. As you guys draw in, 
you notice that there are cameras that watch the door. And with a flick of the wrist, Perun envelops their lens with darkness. We don't have a lot of time before they notice that. Acolyte's on the way. Britta has a good amount of academics, and this being a library, what is this meant to look like? A book fault? Uh, roll me in intelligence academics. Uh -huh. One success. With one success, you know Sterling Memorial Library, recalling they've researched this place before, mm. has underground tunnels that connect it to other locations on campus. And supposedly the purpose of these tunnels is actually to uh, move steam and should be filled with pipes and completely useless in terms of travel. Um, and those doors probably just grant access to the useless space that uh, definitely has nothing to do with the kindred. Well, those dots do feel pretty connected. Britta will start to investigate the door. She's not going to touch it, but she can feel that there's that sense of repulsion and there's a stupid sliver of hope that if she could figure out the puzzle that maybe they can get in before the acolyte but she knows that this is a last ditch effort as you approach the door the rest of them stack up off to the side letting you be point on this and you examine the door and it just looks like a locked double door entrance to some sort of massive tunnel system i have gloves on i'll try tracing a finger to it you examine mm -hmm. no harm comes to you uh, but it is locked. A little bit of larceny. And try and fiddle with it. You have enough time for one roll. As you go to fiddle with it, you do notice that the lock is incredibly intricate. Dex larceny, difficulty nine. Mm -hmm. Spend a willpower. Okay. Four successes. Okay. With expert skill, you pick the lock. Eagle raises a hand and helps you to open the door. And now the door makes no sound. Rita is inclined to try to move in. She's hoping that... Maybe if they go fast enough, that means the acolyte's not necessary. This is her hope. <laughs> As the group of you make your way in, and upon reaching the other side of the door, you find yourself concealed under a cloak of shadows that renders the group invisible. Just as the acolyte arrives. Mm, a sinking feeling, but... The acolyte looks confused for a moment, and Shrike reveals himself, completing the summons. Shrike looks towards you, kind of tilts his head. Hey, guy. He's not directing the guy to, like, open any second lock or anything? Nope, he's greeting the guy and buying you a moment to jump him. Britta does hesitate. She is trying to think of a way not to. But all she can think about is that bloodlust she heard in Shrike earlier. She's terrified that if she... The, the thought crosses her mind to try and dread gaze him, the acolyte. But she's afraid if she makes him run that it'll be worse. So, ashamed, she goes to pull him in for the kiss. Okay. Dex plus uh, brawl. Mm -hmm. You have surprise. Uh, but I have no so brawl. So roll dex plus stealth. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Uh, does the spec graceful count? It does. Six successes. Two is four. Two successes will carry over into your attack roll. And you have two dice from trying to grab him from behind. So you're going to roll just your dex plus hilarity plus four dice. Just. But then you're going to have it because you want to grapple. Bite. And she's splitting her die pool, basically. Mm-hmm. That's two ones and no successes. <laughs> he accidentally bite his jawbone. <laughs> you go to grab him uh -huh. and your fingers slip right off of his tweed jacket. <laughs> Shrike gives you a look and we roll initiative. Shrike will be going on to 23. Ugh. 13. Okay. Shrike very casually snatches the man with a hand gripping him by the chin, and he turns this poor young college student's face so that he's looking at Shrike, and Shrike's eyes blink and are suddenly that of a cobra. And this young man, clearly meant to look like a student, probably an intentional guise, falls helpless to his gaze. 
The guilt just still spread as balance. But Shrike grabs him, establishes eye contact, and seems to paralyze him with this serpentine power. And Britta does as she was going to do, to lean in to give the kiss. She doesn't even know if any of that pleasure, any of whatever small amount of comfort she might be able to give in this action could get through whatever's happening with the eyes, but she's trying. Are you going to get a plus two die bonus for attempting to grab him from behind? And because he is woefully distracted, you'll get mm -hmm. an extra, uh, you get a minus one difficulty to your grapple attempts. So dex plus brawl, diff five. I'll spend a willpower. Four successes. You snatch him right up. Your celerity action. Drink. Once you enact the kiss, combat ends. Mm -hmm. How much are you taking? Britta has full blood. She's doing this so that she can... She can't think of a way out for him. Britta is already very aware of the heat that's been brought onto her coterie from her involvement in the TMR, and that fear leads her to do as she's told. You feel him die in your arms, lost to artificial throes of ecstasy. And as his flesh turns pale and he is ensanguinated I need from you a conscience roll at difficulty 8 a bit of blood falls in a tear as she does what she's doing who knows if that regret will linger or not you feel <laughs> an ice cold hand against your back whose hand is that? when you look it appears to be Romeo attempting to comfort you I succeed by one you wish you had thought a little quicker, did something faster, sweet-talked, Shrike, saved him somehow, and it eats at you that this young man had to die. The man whose teeth are like that of a shark crouches down with a pinprick to his finger from his razor-sharp thumbnail. He presses just the smallest drop of blood to the flesh of your victim, and the young man crumbles to ash. Britta had already been a bit pulling away from Romeo. His comfort in this circumstance, she doesn't know what to do with it because she can't place where his, how much he's with them, how much he's with her. She is doing something horrible and she knows she's doing something horrible and she knows she's doing it for selfish reasons and his comfort doesn't feel good. But at the same time, as she's starting to pull inwards, the body turns to ash, and that's horrifying. Britta takes a couple steps back. There. The one with the eerie smile says, All gone, like he never was. Nothing to feel bad about it anymore. Shall we? Britta turns, and she wipes the tear off her face, just hating herself and everything for what she's done. She'll follow along, but she'll, she won't be leading the group right now. Eagle sort of tucks you behind him, and he takes point for the fire team. And the column starts to make its way. The items that were carried by the ghoul are quickly collected by Shrike. And he seems to go through the little occult objects that this man had carried. And he uses them as a means of bypassing a handful of mystical defenses. A strange ward here... A watching gargoyle there. Not not the kind of gargoyle you ran into last time. This time, just an inanimate statue. It still provokes nervousness. <laughs> Britta absolutely heightens her sense of vision to check over for any sense of movement. But eventually, as you travel down this tunnel, you come to a point where you start to recognize the fungus that was outside of Wind's home. Is it growing organically, or has it been planted places? It has not been planted places. It looks like there are just veins of this orangey, spongy, fleshy fungus. Does it look like the Tremere have tried to get rid of it? It doesn't appear that they've noticed anything about it. It's very subtle, and it's your heightened senses that reveal it to you. That processes that she can see that based on that choice. 
Is Eagle moving in the same direction as the fungus? Yes. Britta is going to keep a specific lookout where the fungus leads. Uh, we seem to f- be following in the same direction for now, but I want to keep an eye out for, firstly, how anything here is affected by the fungus. I've seen what it does in nature, and being able to see how it affects the Chantry, maybe magical items within the Chantry, and if it might have insight into what's going on at Hell House, because Britta associates that fungus with, well, what had happened with the weeping bear. She has not seen it generally around Vito himself. So she is doing the math on, is this something that she hasn't noticed when Vito has had a presence somewhere? Or has he been able to bring some element or some additional creature? That sort of mindset. You see it, Perrin says to you. Yes, I've seen it before, but not around Vito. Eagle raises a fist, signaling for the group to hold. Britta does. As you peer in, you can listen to the acolytes monitoring the situation. Heighten my hearing for that. They seem to be discussing the section of the Shantry that is currently sealed off and seem to indicate that they are attempting to gather what information they can from it, but the Shantry is to be closed within the next few weeks. By context of their discussion and sort of the way that they might glance around the space, does that appear to be the same section of the Chantry that the fungus is leading towards? Likely, yes. Okay. How many voices are there? Three. Are we still obfuscated? No. What is the purpose of this room? What kind of items are here? So right now, you are kind of around the corner from the entrance to a main space. This area, it looks like they can monitor it. It looks like it kind of takes an L shape and leads into this room that you can't quite see very well into. But it looks like, uh, from what you can make out, like a foyer. Like a main entrance to some sort of like, uh, honestly, what would be like some sort of like very like nice, almost mansion-esque location. But it looks like it's kind of this, that they use it as almost like a waiting room at a doctor's office before anyone kind of gets let into the main areas where work is done. Does their conversation seem near conclusion? It does. Their conversation starts to take a turn towards looking for someone named Scott, who uh, sort of abruptly left in the middle of the conversation. Britta swallows down the feelings that she can't suppress. She's hoping that that search will lead them away. She's of the mind to wait the conversation out and see if they will just go. You see one of them collects an SMG from a locker, and with an SMG kind of hanging on a sling and a wand in their hand, they start making their way to the hall where you guys are. Has Britta seen Tremere once before? may well be the first time you ever see someone literally pull a wand. (laughs) Well, there's just a flicker of confusion. This isn't someone I recognize. I mean, none of the Tremere really are showing up much at court. Uh, The Tremere don't usually make a very strong presence at court. So absolutely not someone who I would know their name or anything of that nature. Is Eagle the one who has been obfuscating us? Yes. Does he look like he'll do it again? He looks like he's willing to, but he's so very skilled at stealth that he's not going to exert it unless someone feels they particularly need it. I am curious for as to how the first level of obfuscate works. If you stay still, you're invisible. Then I am inclined to stay still and be invisible. Okay. <laughs> the first acolyte, well, second, jogs past with a wand and SMG. The other two remain in there. As that person takes off, members of the team start slipping in. At this point, as they enter that main foyer area, that is when the obvious case starts going into effect. And this time, uh, it seems to be Eagle and Shrike who drop the next two. Britta, using what Neil had given her, and the small amount of knowledge that and access to obfuscation that she has, had in her guilt genuinely had the naive hope that they would be using that obfuscate to slip past and not do what they just did. And she just feels that guilt just feels worse as she realizes how unlikely that thought had been. When the two of them make the kill, it's quick. They drain them dry. Shrike does not seem phased by the act. However, 
eagle seems to intone some unspoken like prayer, like he's mouthing words. And it's almost as though he is apologizing for some sin. But the body language and the way he intones it is like like a prayer for prey. More like saying thanks for what has been given than saying sorry for what has been taken. Like an apology that we met in such a way. Mm. But thank you for like fueling the work that I must do. Yeah. That's that stifles the urge towards sympathy she has for Eagle at first. At, at for a split second she almost starts stepping forward to she doesn't even know what. The idea of trying to give some amount of comfort to someone that she is being dragged into the circumstance with is a bit ridiculous as she, the step falters, but hearing yeah. it... You can definitely tell he has... He is certainly aware that what he is doing is wrong. Mm. But he seems to feel that, that what you are attempting to do here makes those sins acceptable. That inclines spread at a speed back up and go more towards the section that they were speaking about. Not to rush, but... Again, that pale hope that maybe the quicker that they're in and out, the fewer lives will have to go for this. Phantom, again, is very careful to reduce the bodies that are left to ash. Once they have confirmation that they're through the magical defenses that have been placed, that is when the team starts to split up. Perun gestures for Eagle and Shrike to start locating the Tremere and begin removing them. Tanak and him look to you. Well, the two of them are off, searching for Tremere, removing obstacles. We need to find Vito quickly. The tunnel system here covers a great deal of the campus. Our time will be limited because once the clan is alerted that one of their chantries has been sacked, they will move to defend it. Then let's keep following the trail. He gives a nod. As he does, Phantom starts to peruse through the remains or ash that was left behind and what they were looking at in this room before the group of you crashed in. And this, this foyer space, strangely, has a very small stockpile of ritual components, weapons, things that they've been collected for, collecting from other areas of the Chantry. You're kind of getting the impression that the Tremere do not expect to be able to hold this location for long. Is there any repeating theme in what Phantom is looking at? Like, maybe something was particularly protective? Phantom will actually kind of point it out that there is an entire wing of this subterranean chantry that has been completely sealed off. I expect you will find him there. Britta is tight in her posture, but she just nods and looks to the other two to follow. Phantom and Romeo seem to stay put and seem more interested in securing this location. And Romeo, exercising whatever strange, wraithly abilities he possesses, seems to haunt this space, seizing control of it. Perun gestures to you, and the three start heading t- down the wing. Britta will not be dropping the auspicious enhancements to her eyesight and to her hearing. She'll keep them up, and... Partly to be following the Trail of Mushrooms, and partly just as a precaution. As you head down the wing that's closed off, a lot of the lighting, the lights that they keep to kind of illuminate these tunnel pathways, are blown out and it's darker. What few remain functional kind of blink on and off. What seems to have blown them out, if there's any, if there's any indication? Fungal growths. Yep. That tracks. Eventually... You get to this very, like, heavy, heavy, heavy looking security door. And the security door is slick and ruddy and has this kind of orangey tinge. Does it smell like blood? Orangey. It smells like meat. Meat. Is the orange matching the fungus? Yes. This door looks heavy, but does it look locked? Uh, it does appear to be quite locked down. Britta is going to stealthily approach the door keeping her hearing very focused on the other side, in case there's some sign of movement that she could translate as a hint. As you listen to the other side, you hear groans of pain. Do they sound like they belong to Vito? Anyone else? 
You don't recognize that as Vito's voice. Okay. So, Britta is going to give unlocking the door a go. It is a dex plus larceny at a difficulty of nine. As you approach the door, I need a willpower check to not become impossibly lost. Ah, speaking of willpower checks, when would you like that? Why don't you go ahead and give me the, the that one now, mm-hmm. and then we'll follow it up with the resistance to the Shantry defenses. Can I spend willpower on either? On the second. Okay. So the first one being the your, strike of midnight. <laughs> your permanent willpower score. Yep. Yep. Three for the week of nightmares roll that just happened. Okay. And now I need a willpower roll to resist the uh, enchantment. Your difficulty is six and you can spend willpower. I will do so. I do not want to be lost here forever. Tens being one success, right? Yes. Two successes. Okay. You do not find yourself suddenly lost while attempting to walk a straight line, and you make it to the door. Mm -hmm. Now for the door, it looks like there is a electronic lock on it. You have the tools with which you can pick at it and attempt to trigger it unlocking, uh, but it is very difficult. So you are going to be rolling at a difficulty of nine. We do have access to that whole prep room. If I go around and take a look, how far back was that? The prep room? A short walk, but a bit of a distance to travel. I'll give it a go. I'll spend another willpower. No successes. You work at it, and you hear like a buzzing noise. A slight red light, and it does not allow you to pass it. Britta turns and shakes her head. I haven't got this. It's beyond me. He looks to Tanakh. We are going to have to force the door. And he looks a little concerned when he says that. She approaches the door and gently shoves it off its uh, hinge. And the big steel door collapses to the ground in front of you. And on the other side of that door, there are no working lights. But it stinks. It smells like infected flesh. The walls are runny with mucus and pus. Against the wall, across from the door, you see the source of those groans, a Tremere. One of the ones who was even present when the killing spree first arrived to New Haven. And they are caked against the wall. It is conscious. Blood pumps through it, but it is connected to this complex network that runs the walls, the ceilings, the floor of fungus that is spread through the area like veins, like the nerves of a thing. This being a chantry, there's probably at least candles within reach for illumination, or is that a wrong assumption? Britta looks. When you look in the area, Mm -hmm. you see a lot of wet, sloppy boxes And within were ritual components, old reports, books, what have you. It looks like this area they were trying to pack it up and pull out, Mm -hmm. but it was overrun before they could finish. Uh, Among those things, you do find a candle. Any way to light it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Britta will hold on to that for now. She's not going to light it at this moment, but she's hoping to stick to stealth even through this. At least if there's any chance of it. We did just kick down a door, obviously, so I know that we made quite the uh, announcement, but I'm unsure of how capable this person is of seeing us. Whoever it is tries to communicate with you. Britta approaches. Britta would like to make a medicine throw to see what's going on, if he might be missing a tongue or... Give me an intelligence medicine. Your difficulty is five. Two successes. With two successes, you're leaning close and determine that this Tremere, or remains of them, that is caked against the wall covered in this mushroom and flesh and spongy tissue, and one of the eyes moves while the other is paralyzed, and he looks right at you. You're certain that he has his tongue, because what he says is... Kitty cat. 
All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca sounds so tired. <laughs> Initiative? I don't. <laughs> Kitten. Does it sound like Vito's voice? No. Oh, cadence, not initiative. But the cadence is right. Those are not his vocal cords, but he's using them. Looking him over, if I speak to him and say, are you yourself? Trying to test how much of this person is left. Kitten. Beretta is reviled by what's happened to this person and certainly uh, disquieted by this, but is going to light her candle now, getting ready to go deeper in. You light the candle. You have a look around and realize that there is a doorway to each side. The fungal presence is worse both ways, but more importantly, you realize that you're alone. On that realization, she looks back towards where the seal door was kicked in, trying to figure out what has happened to the other two. They seem missing. I will attempt to call out for them. You wait for a response, and all you hear behind you... Kitten. But nothing from them. For the pure sake of trying to figure out this new horror... Britta is going to walk towards the seal door, the one that she came from. Just see if it works. She's been trapped in too many time loops lately to not give that a go. You make it to the doorway, and the only thing that is unusual is that this fungus seems to grow so rapidly that while you are working on other things, veins of it have already expanded through the now open doorway. I'll try calling out the names again and see what happens, just in case they left. You call out. And the only thing this time you hear is your voice echoing in the tunnel. Britta tightens her grip on the pistol in her hand and keeping the candle upright still makes sure to place the knife in that same hand as the candle. And heads on in. And then there's a choice between the two paths, kind of a left or right situation. Yes, there is. Is there any identifying information about left or right? To the left, there is the light of kind of one of those blinking fluorescent lights from down here. The other way is just pitch black. And it's equally fungusified? Oh, yes. All right. Let's go into the dark. Britta, very much in battle mode, tense and ready, decides upon the path that doesn't already have a light set in it. I mean, she keeps her eyes on the poor warped Tremere as long as she can, but... As soon as that path, like the darkness of it, overtakes, her focus is entirely there. You venture into the dark, and as you go forward, you come to a hall with a handful of open doorways at each flank. So each side, there are these rows of open doorways. When you peer into the first one, you see what looks like an open space, cement floor, an old chalk sigils drawn onto the floor, And you start to kind of piece together that this is some ritual space Mm. where young Tremere would probably go when preparing for the night. They'd have access to all of the components that are available right here for them to do their evening rituals. And then they could be on their way. When you look to the left, you see a small 10 foot by 10 foot room. And all there is is a now emptied bookshelf, soaked and ruined clothing lying around. A handful of components and a cot. Soaked in what? The same fluid? It looks like mucus. Whatever it is, it's like thick and reflects the light of the candle. Does the clothing match Vito's size, theoretically? It does not. One of the main articles of clothing that stand out to you is a robe. And keeping Vito in mind, are there vents, drains, that kind of thing? Oh, yes. And the vents, what pipes you find, Mm. they are covered in this stuff. When Britta's eyes flit around the room, those start to become some of the first places her eyes land. But she'll go on to a couple of the other doors. As you head up back out into the hallway to continue your investigation, back where that unfortunate soul was pressed against the wall, you hear a squelching noise. I will go back and investigate. And as you take just a step... 
mm. in that direction. You hear the clicking of many legs moving down to the floor. And you recognize the sound. And it reminds you of your past visit to Hell House. At that sound, Britta puts the knife away and switches guns. This isn't pistol time anymore. The assault rifle is in both hands. Okay. She sets the candle down at her feet and gets ready. Sure enough, a kind of milky, wet head comes crawling into the room on these legs that seem made from ribs and intestines. Britta is spending enough time to absorb this visually before shooting. That's all. Give me an attack roll. Five successes. Four dice will roll over into damage. It's a lot of ones. Three damage. Uh, with three successes, you actually kill it. Britta did not expect that. Britta was really prepared for the horse, and she remains so as they're to come. It makes a coconut cracking noise, and inside you just see chunks of this fungus that seems to have overrun and rotted the brain out. Is that the Tremere, the one that had been caked against the wall? Oh, yes. There's a moment of that visceral horror of seeing how far gone. As you take that moment, you notice that the fungus and the veins and the flesh and and this viscous whatever it is mm. is growing very rapidly. I can see and, it now. And you can now see that it has grown along in the direction of the trail you have walked mm -hmm. and the way that a plant grows toward the sun. It's following my steps. Yes, like like this fungus, it, it can't move, it can't mm -hmm. grab you, but you know for certain that it hungers for your blood. Britta's not convinced by the narration that it can't grab her, so she's going to go ahead and keep moving once she's taken this thing out. I'll try going back to that hallway with the other doors, if, if there are doors that I haven't looked into. There are, and as you're looking through some of the doors, you can see apprentices, Tremere, bound to the bed have grown have grown into the wall the floor it's like over the course of a day this fungus grew rampant through this place and as they slept it took them Britta can feel that sort of shaking coldness that in a human usually accompanies a heart thumping and that kind of terror but in this body it's just this strange sensation of where it should be how many Tremere am I looking at? In this area? Yes. You count three in all, including that first one they had to shoot in the head. And they look similarly degraded? Yes. I'm shooting them. Okay. Effectively, when Britta intends to shoot, she'll set the candle down so as not to be trying to shoot this with one hand. One of them kind of twitches and screams when you kill it. Britta bites back the horror at, like, shooting something that looks so humanoid, but the twitching is a terrible vindication. Can I get a perception investigation? Yep. Heightened senses is still up. It's normally diff 8, but you've got the candle reducing the darkness penalty. So yep, diff yep. 7, and then another uh, reduction equal to your auspex rating. So that's a difficulty of 4. One success. With one success, you reach the end of the hall and find that there is a stairwell that goes deeper and further down into this complex. But at the top of the stairs, backing away and fleeing when it really gets a good look at you, is a hand, a severed human hand that is covered in pustules and teeth, and it flees you. Did it appear to have eyes? No. And if it did, gone now. I realize with all the pustules that this might be a, a complete non-question, but would the skin tone match Vito? The skin tone does not match Vito. All right. That hand is Tremere made. Oh, extra gross. Well, uh, I'm going to try to follow that hand to shoot it down, I suppose. You follow the hand down. By the time you're down that floor, mm -hmm. the hand is gone. Well, I've ended up here anyway, so I lifted the candle. What you see around. before you is a vault that is sealed, but it doesn't seem hermetically sealed anymore, as area around it has kind of overgrown with this fungus. There are windowed lab spaces, and within one, you see this thing that looks like an imp. It is very, very small, maybe a foot tall, 
and this very kind of sick, withered, homunculus kind of looks and seems confused that there's anyone even here. And it seems to already be showing signs of infection, but is hiding in one of the lab rooms that don't have very much in the way of these veins and tendrils of flesh. Does it look like the gargoyle? It definitely looks like a creature that was created through the use of hermetic thaumaturgy. It looks like a little magical thing, but the little magical thing does not seem overly resistant to what, whatever it is that's spreading through here. Britta, her eyes scanning over what's happened to it and the way that it's hiding, tries to say, hey, just to see if it can respond. It makes uh, a confusing sound and turns behind it. And behind uh, some of these boxes that had been arranged again to pack up and move out of the space, you see a familiar face as Reese reveals himself. On absolute reflex, Britta's next reflex is to say, hey, again, uh, just out of pure shock, but does he look infected? He does not. What the hell are you doing here? He seems irritated that you have involved yourself in this. Britta doubles over his appearance, deeply confused and surprised that he seems okay. He seems haggard and like he's having a... A rough go at it, but seems to have locked this little room that he's in down. You can hear him largely because of heightened senses. The, mm -hmm. the glass between you muffles a great deal. Miss Cerise, um, you're not safe here. And why might that be? He says sarcastically, gesturing to the apocalypse that the <laughs> two of you are stating it. No, I mean, all of this, it's getting cleared out. Is your coterie here? Has Miles deemed necessary to insult the Tremere further? He talks to you, but, like, he's very quickly packing up some information and is, like, filling this, like, leather kind of messenger bag up. Britta looks around again. Are there signs of more dead in here? In the room that he is in? No. But there are definitely bodies that are overgrown monsters made in service to the Tremere that are infected and transformed. One of the labs has something big kind of just brooding and pacing in it. It doesn't seem to have the, the sensory organs necessary to detect you, but it is big and moves. Miss Cerise, how many people have died here? He looks like... He looks like he has no intentions of answering that question but regrets the truth of it. Enough, then, if not handled correctly. All of this can end up having been wasteful, meaningless in the end. But you have not explained why you are here, and how you got in here. It's not my coterie. I'm sorry, but I have to kill Vito. You cannot kill Vito. He's too important. He puts his hands up. Please, I could exert my will over you. I could. But I am not going to. I am going to hope you recognize that what I am telling you is the truth. Vito Zantosa is connected to an ancient vampire of incredible power. So ancient. So powerful. That they themselves are a sympathetic link to what could be vampire kind. The horrors you see here happen everywhere. The kindred are cruel and monstrous. I am no exception, but surely you've learned at this point that I am speaking the truth. Vito Zantosa represents freedom from the kindred condition. We could make the world better. And to do that, I am willing to sacrifice many lives. Because for thousands of years... For thousands of years into our future, I will have saved many more. Vito must live. What do you mean when you say freedom from the kindred condition? You know exactly what I mean. Britta looks his eyes. That is a solid hook for her. Scanning back and forth, looking for the truth. There is a disaster coming. Something truly terrible. 
And the only way, the only way to survive it is to not be kindred at all. Help me. Let's get out of this place, and I will reward you. Britta can't conceal that she's considering it, but the way she got here with the Tamahira is weighing on her. As you consider, a hand slaps against the glass beside you. When you look, Perun is there. Britta startles. She turns the gun immediately, but lowers it slightly. You must not allow distraction, he says, kind of confused and way haggard compared to when you saw him just a little while ago. Does he look orange at all? No, but he does look to have suffered wounds and is visibly, like, incoherent. Mm -hmm. I have found Vito. Come, I'll show you. Is there any that way that we could work together? Breda looks between the two. By the time you look back to uh, Reese, he's gone. Breda bites back the sound of surprise, feeling a bit foolish for having been surprised at all, but hope keeps getting her. She swallows it down, looks back to Perrin, and dips her head in a slight nod. This way, he leans and walks like he's got kind of like this slightly broken neck. That seems in control of himself. She's slow. She looks around for Reese again, but she does eventually follow, dragging her feet. You scan the area, but don't see Reese. And as you head deeper in, you arrive to what looks to be prison cells. Spaces specifically made to hold, well, things like Vito. And one of them uh, is every bit of cell as it is as much like an observation room. Like a space to hold something that you can watch from like the hall. And that room is filled with gore that clings to the ceilings, the floor, the walls. And sitting barefoot and just kind of linen pants and a shirt or cotton pants and a shirt is this hideously malformed Vito Zentosa. Ah. There you are. He sniffs the air. I knew you were here. I have been thinking of you. He says, approaching the glass. When you say malformed, again, can he see me? By the sniffing, I'm not so sure. His eyes seem very uh, pink and kind of messed up, but they at least track in your direction. Turning back to Perrin, is he there? Yes, but he's just kind of staring blankly. Britta looks at him, a bit of desperation, and puts her hand on his forearm. And she says, You needed me to be here for this to go right? He leans down and says to you, Kitten. Perrin? Yes. Initiative. <laughs> and that is when you hear sounds from all of the other labs as glass starts to shatter everywhere. Ira, Miles, and Wynn. The three of you are gathered at Miles' office just as he's sort of determining what to replace the the bust with so that he has something occupying that now empty space and it's just the three of you kind of recovering from whatever it was that Wynne experienced. Wynne didn't think to gather clothes before she left. She grabbed what was important to her, which was basically her books, any little tchotchkes she'd brought, her dad's gun, which more of a teddy bear at this point than an actual functioning firearm for her but she kind of once they get up in the office she kind of puts her bag down and looks to miles you don't happen to have like any extra clothes here do you for you in your size yes i do i was <laughs> gonna take anything from anywhere but i shouldn't be surprised yeah no i have it for just about every one of you about two sets worth ira cracks like half a smile and shows a lot of forethought you grace we get into a lot of fights He's a learning robot. Yeah, does that happen a lot around here? 
the uh, professional what? curiosity. What did happen? If you don't mind sharing. I don't mind sharing, but Miles, where clothes where? So, yeah. He goes over to a closet and he grabs, like, essentially a package of clothing that is still with tags and whatnot. And is like, here you go. Should um, be your exact size. Wynn just kind of takes it. Thank you. And she just actually goes into the closet and shuts the door behind her and starts talking. As soon as she's out of sight, Ira cocks a thumb at the closet she just walked into and mouths, is that normal? Miles just nods his head and goes over to his desk and shakes his head a little bit and listens. So I had come back from looking for Kabir. Everything, something's fucking with me and my ability to track him. Um, I... I would follow his trail for a while, and then the trail would get kind of hinky, and then I would end up right back at the hotel room. And I can't decide whether that means he's there and I can't see him, or he's fucking with me and doesn't want me to find him, or it's not his choice that I find him or not. So then I figured I should at least be productive in other ways and so i pulled i destroyed the tv for one thing because i'm sick of hearing about sri lanka because that that fucking messed with him too she comes out of the closet and like pulls her boots on proceeds to start yanking price tags off you're supposed to do that before you put them on but yeah um i was in the dark in a closet there were priorities you can't get her new shoes i won't wear them yeah at this point it's a it's a living habitat and i would feel bad about killing it um, no. anyway, so there's, there is no indication in her voice that what she is saying is a joke, but there's no indication that it's not. <laughs> Just go take you at face value. <laughs> That's probably a good move. So I took the call from Miles. I literally hang up seems like the weird word. I pressed the button to disconnect. And then I heard something scraping at the window and it was, I looked back out past the curtain a little bit and it was dozens dozens of starving kindred with their teeth bared and screaming for ravana and hunger and ravana and then they burst in through the bathroom window and they started clambering over to me and i tried turning into mist but they got a hit in on me and and i couldn't i couldn't i felt it it was there and there was nothing I could do about it. Not to disagree, Sheriff, but evidence says it wasn't there. Bathroom window wasn't broken, and nothing happened to your body. Well, I'm dealing with a fucking Ravnos here, so who the fuck knows? It was real for me. He nods his head like, yeah, that's a fair point. And I know it wasn't real because I wasn't devoured by 20 or 30 hungry whites. To some sort of mental attack of some sort. This goes along with the other weird things we've been Who hearing about. Who the fuck about. is Ravana? I'm sorry, I go to you for these questions. I, I've, only, I've heard the name in like legends and stuff, but I have no idea what bearing that would have on this now. No, it might. Kabir's the one I would ask. Puts you step up over, I guess, the rest of us. I mean, I can look into it, but I'm not 100% I would get a clear answer. I mean, your mutual woods friend might be an answer. Raven? Yeah. Where is she? Fuck knows. She's supposed to be local to the area. Hypothetically, she is, but she's also gangrel and she does what she wants. She went independent quite a few months back and she's not really beholden to anyone here. She, We talk, she answers my messages, apparently if I'm not in a city, but... That puts you, again, a step up over some of the rest of us. I can try and get into contact with her, but I don't... She's dealing with... When kind of puts her... She kind of just kind of perches on the edge of the desk and pulls a knee up and kind of puts her hand on her head and it's just like... She's dealing with larger issues, and I'll, I'll be very honest, as long as she's dealing with them, she's she's not a threat to anyone around here. My understanding from Mr. Giovanni is those larger issues or maybe what you and I need to talk to her about. It's possible. If you can put a word in, he uh, leans up against the wall kind of near where that ashtray was and pulls out the pack of Morley's. 
just still okay with you? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. It's going to be a common occurrence around here. Wynn kind of pats the pockets for a minute for getting their new pants and then goes into the closet and checks her pants and to see if she has a joint. So, she doesn't. Uh, <laughs> part of the things I want to do around here is talk to Raven, conclude this business with Mr. Giovanni. What exactly does Mr. Giovanni want to talk to Raven about? You hear one of the heavy doors from down the hall open and close, and the sound of boots come tromping down the hall till there's a loud banging on the door. Come on in. You don't even want to check, see who it is first. Johnny opens the door. Your come, office, your grace. Comes in. He is covered in viscera. <laughs> His mouth is stained with uh, with blood. He still has the revolver in one hand, and he does not look completely hinged. I, um... I got some problems. Oh, well, all right. Who the fuck is this guy? You sure you didn't want to check to see who it was first? Iris says, like, looking at this fucking blood-soaked psychopath who just walked into the prince's office. Well, I generally allow my seneschal in here. Oh. Wynn kind of dis- dis- Right, seneschal? right, 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 seneschal. Johnny kind of walks himself through that. Wynn kind of discreetly <laughs> stands up from the desk, ready to jump between Johnny and Ira if need be. Ira does the little sleight of hand trick and taps the pack, so instead of one, there's two. Uh, Morley's poking out the top and just, well, Seneschal, looks like you could use a smoke. Johnny reaches over, pulls a cigarette out. Yeah. Johnny, uh, this is Ira. Ira is a guest of Mr. Giovanni's and it currently has hospitality in the domain. Welcome. So what are you, a uh, member of Quan Giovanni? No, I'm... Doing a favor for some other people in Clan Tremere for Mr. Giovanni. And there's like a little pop and snap of arc light off of his fingers that goes to the tip of Johnny's cigarette and the tip of his own cigarette. And both Morley's are lit. It's the first fucking practical magic I've seen in this office. <laughs> I mean, the last guy wasn't known for his magic. Johnny kind of looks down at the cigarette with a sneer. Back up, to, <laughs> Back up to Ira. <laughs> He looks down, like, he catches the, the, like, sneer, looks down at the cigarette, and goes, not Morley's, more of a Newport guy. No, it's my brand, I just, uh, look, I, I won't hold the Tremere bit against you. He takes a drag. Yeah, that seems to be common reaction. Has Court got a problem with the, what's been going on that's caught, you know what, we can get to that in a bit. Yeah, first day. We will. We might not air any dirty laundry, but we'll yeah, see yeah, how yeah. things go. Since when have I held back? You are sheriff now. Mm -hmm. what, what does it mean when you shoot a werewolf in the head three times with silver bullets and it's not dead? I don't know. The last time we used a knife. <laughs> <laughs> Means you should try a knife. Ira looks totally flabbergasted, like just very put together. Nope. Full on his face. Just like, what the fuck core is this? <laughs> Um, Miles signals for the like Johnny to to pass the gun over and like I got some more clothes for you in there if you want to change. Kind of, Johnny kind of looks down at himself and nods, passes the gun over. Hey, maybe like a wet wipe or something. Yeah, there's too. a bathroom adjoined here. He uh, as you as he walks over to the bathroom, you guys notice there are very large claw marks opening up the back of his leather jacket. Yeah, Wynn doesn't let that go. You just kind of, Jesus Christ, Johnny. And she, like, grabs him by the shoulder and, like, to get a look and, like, touches the tears. He uh, he takes the jacket off and hands it to her, swaps out, uh, t pulls off the the T-shirt the that he's wearing and starts kind of wiping the blood off of himself and goes to change clothes. Well, I got, uh, he's, he's, he's in the back of my car. I, I need a place to bring him or to hold, I, I have no, how do you hold a werewolf? I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry. What? I was gonna kill him, but Sheila convinced me not to. What? Well, one of the hunters is dead. I I don't know what the fuck's going on. Wait, which? What's going? <laughs> Who's? So we're gonna need a lot more cigarettes. And at that, the phone rings. Path of Night is a Vampire the Masquerade podcast set in the world of darkness. Britta Ashcroft, the Toreador, was played by Rebecca Segelfest. Johnny Saxon, the Bruja, was played by Garrett Gabby. Miles Savinport, the Venture, was played by Tim Davis. Neil Foster, the Malkavian, was played by Rob Meerhead. Wynn Cabot, the Gangrel, was played by Erica Webb. Your storyteller was Lex Lopez. Recording by Rebecca Stagelfest. 
This episode edited by Rob Meerhead. The music used in this episode was composed for Path of Night by Brian Metolius. Find him online at brianmetolius.com. Path of Night uses the 20th anniversary edition of Vampire the Masquerade with a few limited house rules. Vampire the Masquerade and the World of Darkness are owned by Paradox Interactive. Make sure to subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We can be found on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Path of Night. You can help support the show on coffee.com slash Path of Night. Find us on twitter.com slash Path of Night Pod, on facebook.com slash Path of Night Podcasts, or email us at Path of Night Podcasts at gmail.com. See you next time, Kindred. It's not a good day for trying to save NPCs. <laughs> you have no idea. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I have no idea, but yeah, I know. <laughs> I agree with you on both The vibe counts. is strong. <laughs>